Good evening. I'm Mike Perret. Tonight, I'm serving as host of the Army Heritage Center Foundation's lecture program. The tonight, this program is being supported by FN America, one of our nation's uh, largest uh, manufacturer for military uh, weapons for both the military and for police departments. Uh, the Army Heritage Center Foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. The center is the Army's premier archival facility. Uh, with over 23,000 linear feet of archival materials that is currently being digitized to be made available online worldwide. Also an extensive military history library and affiliated museum galleries uh, and an Army Heritage Trail. But tonight, we're pleased to have Dr. Sean Brennan. Uh, Dr. Brennan is a professor of history at the University of Scranton. He joined the university in 2009 after completing his doctorate at the University of Notre Dame. He is a specialist in political and religious history of the 20th century, as well as the history of international relations, especially the Cold War period. He has written four books, The Politics of Religion in Soviet-Occupied Germany in 2011, The Priest Who Put Europe Back Together, The Life of Fabian Flynn, which was published in 2008, The KBG and the Vatican, uh, which was published this past year in 2022, and Warren Austin, Henry Cabot Lodge, and the Cold War at the United Nations from 1949 to 1960, again in 2022. He is currently working on a book concerning pivotal speeches of the Cold War. Dr. Brennan, the floor is now yours. All right, everyone. So uh, here's the uh, first uh, screen, um, which interestingly enough is very similar to the cover of my book. So on the right here, you see holding the uh, Soviet made automatic rifle, uh, preliminary to the Kalashnikov. That's Warren Austin, who was America's first full ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, there were two placeholders before him, but he was the first official one. Uh, and he was Harry Truman's UN ambassador from 1947 to 1953. And then on the left is Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Uh, and this is him from 1959. The picture of Austin is from uh, 1950. And this is actually, excuse me, Lodge's picture is from 1960. Uh, this is after the U-2 incident. If you're wondering what Lodge is doing there, that's when an American spy plane was shot down. Um, piloted by Francis Gary Powers over Soviet territory. And so, of course, the Soviets were at the United Nations accusing the United States of conducting illegal espionage. And um, so the Eisenhower administration had been planning this for a while. They had discovered many years ago the Soviets had stuck a listening device into a wooden uh, carving of the American seal, the American eagle, and then had given it as a gift to the Americans to take to their embassy in Moscow. And so Eisenhower uh, and Christian Herter, who was the Secretary of State, told Lodge, okay, go in the UN and show them the listening device. So that's what uh, Lodge is doing right there. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's I, I like the pictures of both of these men. Uh, one of them, of course, was on the cover uh, of the book. Okay, now, um, there's a number of reasons why I chose to uh, do this kind of uh, a project. As I say in the introduction, I'm hoping everyone gets a chance to read the book, so I won't belabor it. But in the spring of 2001, I was finishing up my last semester at Rockhurst University in Kansas City. So I actually grew up or went to high school and college in an environment where Harry Truman came from and not too far from where Eisenhower came from. Although not these two men, they were both New Englanders. Uh, Austin was from uh, Vermont, and Lodge, of course, was from the famous uh, political dynasty in Boston, Massachusetts. But anyway, I read a book by Alexander George, and this was a book written in the, in the 50s, this is for a political science class, uh, called Woodrow Wilson and Colonel House, A Personality Study. And it concludes with a lengthy examination of the failure of the United States to join the League of Nations, uh, and the author ended it on the ironical note that the United States is now a member of the United Nations, and it's represented there by Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., who is the grandson of Henry Cabot Lodge Sr., who more than anyone else shot down President Wilson's plan for the United States to join the League of Nations, 
after the conclusion of the First World War. And I always thought that was a fascinating bit of uh, historical trivia. And I didn't really know what to do with it, but I thought at some point I should examine this in greater detail. Anyway, it took me the better part of two decades, but uh, a few years ago, I decided to finally go back and to re-examine this question and why it was an important one that Lodge's grandson was representing the United States at the United Nations throughout the duration of the Eisenhower administration, rather than just um, a little bit of historical trivia. And then soon after, I decided to include Warren Austin as well, so I could do a comparison and contrasting between the Truman and Eisenhower administrations and how they dealt with the issue of the Cold War and how they viewed American membership in the United Nations as a means to promote American foreign policy goals, uh, to fight the Cold War against the Soviets, and also to support the United Nations as an institution so it would not go the way of the League of Nations had as a failure, as an organization that failed to stop acts of aggression and failed to stop another world war. And now, of course, in the international environment, where once again, we examine the question of how useful is the United Nations with issues of corruption, with really the failure of the UN to do much about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and with some people claiming the world stands on the brink of war again, not over Ukraine, but possibly Taiwan, I figured that this was a useful time period, a useful subject uh, to go back and examine. So it was kind of a combination of those two things. And also, um, broadly speaking, I think you could break the Cold War itself into about three distinct eras, one from the late 40s to the early 60s, one from the early 60s to the late 70s, and the final one from the late 70s to the early 1990s. So that way, by again, comparing these two ambassadors, who were both America's longest serving ambassadors to the United Nations, Austin served for six and a half years and lodged for almost eight. It's a very stressful job. Uh, that duration pretty much covered this first pivotal stage of uh, the Cold War. Okay, so uh, we'll look at the players first. I, uh, again, chose these images uh, because I love the Time magazine covers of this time period and their uh, paintings of various different historical uh, figures. So um, Warren Austin and Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. had some similarities. Uh, they also had some strong differences as well. Um, but both men, as I mentioned, were from New Englanders, Austin from Vermont, the northern part of the state, and Lodge from Massachusetts. Both were members of the Republican Party. Uh, but both of them at times found themselves at odd with some of the party's positions, particularly on foreign policy. Both men eventually came around to the idea of internationalism, that the United States could not be an isolationist uh, country, and also were committed to the idea that the United States should be part of international organizations and should be committed to making them work as well. So uh, let's uh, start with Austin first then. So he was born in 1877 and lived much of his life um, when he was not in Washington, D.C. as a senator um, in Vermont. He graduated from the University of Vermont, which is where his papers were located, and served as uh, attended law school, served as a, a lawyer in uh, not just in Vermont, but also representing a number of American companies, including a brief stint in China, representing American companies there in the 1920s. Uh, although the political environment, of course, is very different now, at the time of the early 20th century, uh, the Republican Party was very, very strong in uh, the New England area, uh, including in the, in the state of Vermont. And so um, Austin eventually entered into Republican Party policies uh, in the state of Vermont itself, and then eventually uh, won a seat in the late 20s representing the state of Vermont. Um, in the United States Senate, a position he would stay in until uh, 1946. During his time there, during the 1930s, Austin supported the, the largely political consensus, not just in the Republican Party, but in, for much of the United States, that uh, it was not, the United States should not really get involved in foreign conflicts in either Asia or in Europe. And meantime, domestically, he also gained a reputation as a stalwart opponent uh, 
of Franklin Roosevelt and Roosevelt's New Deal programs. And it was indeed Austin was one of the primary spokesmen against FDR's court packing scheme in 1937, which gave him more of a national spotlight. Now, as the Second World War broke out, Austin eventually abandoned his support of isolationism and was a stalwart supporter of the United States war effort, um, even before Pearl Harbor, of the United States getting involved in repelling aggression from the Axis powers, from Nazi Germany and fascist Italy in Europe, and from Imperial Japan uh, in the Pacific. Now, one of his uh, colleagues there in the United States Senate was Harry S. Truman, who was representing the state of Missouri. And the two men became cordial with each other and became friends. And after the Second World War was over and after Harry Truman became uh, president, Austin had a reputation as after perhaps uh, Arthur Vandenberg and Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., more on him in just a moment, as one of the foremost Republican Party spokesmen on foreign policy. Now, um, in 1946, Dean Acheson, who was the Undersecretary of State at the time, and we'll come back to him later, uh, one of the most prominent uh, Democratic Party members in, involved in foreign policy during this time period, informed Truman that the Republicans were likely to do very well in the 1946 midterm elections, which they did. And he suggested that America's first permanent representative to the United Nations should be a member of the Republican Party. So in order to give American involvement in the United Nations more bipartisan support um, and as a way of granting kind of a concession to Truman's uh, political rivals. And Truman agreed to this and made the offer to Austin, who accepted, and his term began in 1947 and, as I mentioned, served for the duration of, of Truman's time uh, in office. And I'll come back to this. There was a, um, his relationship with Truman, with George Marshall and Dean Acheson, the secretaries of state, were very different than the relationship that Lodge had. All right, but again, I'll come back to that. All right, so now the next one is Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., born in 1902, uh, died 1985. Warren Austin died 1962. Uh, now, uh, his family was, of course, as I mentioned, a famous family in Massachusetts and American politics. He had numerous famous ancestors from both his father's side and his mother's side. Um, his father, uh, John uh, Cabot Lodge, was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. He was a published writer and poet. Uh, but he died fairly young when Lodge was still uh, a child. And so Lodge, in many ways, was raised by his famous grandfather and namesake, Henry Cabot Lodge Sr., who, of course, uh, was nicknamed to the United States Senate, where he represented Massachusetts as Mr. Republican, as the leader of Republicans in the Senate, uh, best friends of President Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and, of course, famous later for his opposition to the United States joining the League of Nations, specifically over the idea that the League of Nations, um, if America joined, it would have to commit armed forces if the League of Nations asked them to. And this was something Lodge objected to, saying only Congress had authority for that. Wilson refused to compromise, and so Lodge shot the uh, treaty down. In case anyone's wondering, and I don't want to forget about this later, when I interviewed uh, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr.'s son, he once said that um, he asked his father, what would have your grandfather, my great-grandfather, thought of American membership in the United Nations? And he said grandfather never would have had a problem with it because it didn't limit American sovereignty the way the League of Nations would have. So Lodge led a fascinating life in many ways. He attended Harvard, of course, like his, uh, like many ancestors before him. And he worked for a long time in the 1920s as a journalist for a number of different newspapers, including the New York Herald Tribune, uh, traveled all uh, throughout the world during that time period. And in the 1930s, entered into politics, first in the Massachusetts um, House of Representatives, and then being elected to the United States Senate to represent uh, Massachusetts. And likewise, um, like Austin, initially an isolationist in some ways, also opposed to a number of much of the New Deal, except for Social Security, it was something Lodge was a big supporter of. He had actually introduced a version of Social Security um, and a bill in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. 
Now, when the Second World War came, broke out, Lodge made the, I think, fascinating decision. I think it reveals a lot about him. He became the first United States senator since the Civil War to resign his seat as a senator and enter into the United States Armed Forces to fight in the Second World War. Now, he was sent to Europe. Uh, this is uh, interesting. Something that Austin and Lodge have in common is both men were fluent in French. Austin, because he lived in that part of Vermont that's very near Quebec, and he would live in Quebec in the summers and learn how to speak French. And Lodge, of course, because of his aristocratic family, was educated in a number of private academies in both the United States and in France. So his abilities in French were very good. He could also speak German. So Dwight Eisenhower eventually had Lodge, who rose to the rank of colonel, appointed as one of the official American liaisons of the French army uh, during the Second World War. And it... and. By all accounts, Lodge did a very good job in this capacity. He also developed a close personal friendship with uh, Dwight Eisenhower as well, which would pay uh, dividends later. So after the war was over, uh, Lodge was reelected to the, to the Massachusetts to represent the United States Senate, to work in the United States Senate, representing Massachusetts again in 1946. Now, in 1948, of course, Truman wins a surprise re-election as uh, president. And in 1952, then, the widely believed Republican frontrunner for the GOP nomination to run against Truman was Senator Robert Taft of Ohio uh, from another famous political dynasty, the Tafts of Ohio, where, of course, William Howard Taft, the president, had come from. Robert Taft was his son. Now, one person who was strongly opposed to uh, Taft um, becoming the Republican nominee for president in 1952 was Lodge, uh, possibly because he thought that if Taft got the nomination, he would lose to the Democratic nominee, who turned out to be Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. But Lodge was also worried that if Taft won, he would take the Republican Party to a foreign and domestic policy dead end. And in terms of, uh, of course, foreign policy, uh, Taft tended to be somewhat of an isolationist, and Lodge absolutely was not. And his experiences in the Second World War, and now that the Cold War had broken out the Soviets, was convinced him that America had to play a leading role um, in world affairs going forward from this point onwards. And so, and um, Lodge's foremost biographer, William Nichter, would back me on this, after Eisenhower himself, no one did more to get Eisenhower the nomination for president from the GOP, and no one worked harder to get Eisenhower to throw his hat into the ring to become president in 1952 than Lodge. And even after Eisenhower got the GOP nomination after the 1952 convention in Chicago, and it was a very, very close run thing between Eisenhower's supporters and Taft's supporters, um, Lodge basically served as Eisenhower's uh, campaign manager throughout the 1952 presidential election. So consequently, Lodge somewhat neglected his own campaign running for re-election uh, as a senator from Massachusetts. And so, of course, Eisenhower wins the presidency fairly easily in November of 1952 over Adlai Stevenson. But Lodge lost his reelection bid to a Massachusetts congressman named John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And so this marked kind of the transition between the Lodge political dynasty to the Kennedys during this uh, time period. Now, uh, of course, Eisenhower was deeply disappointed that Lodge had lost. And as I mentioned before, Lodge was seen as a leading Republican figure in foreign policy circles. The problem is, although Eisenhower might have been inclined to grant to Lodge the position of Secretary of State, that had already been reserved for the primary Republican spokesman in foreign policy, and that was John Foster Dulles. Again, more on him in just a moment. And so Eisenhower offered Lodge as a consolation prize the position of American ambassador to the United Nations. And unlike Truman, and I think this is ra rather revealing, Eisenhower elevated the position of American ambassador to the United Nations as um, a cabinet-level position. 
And if you look at a lot of different American pre presidential administrations, um, a number of them have um, elevated the position of American ambassador to the United Nations to the president's cabinet, but others have not. Uh, others have not done that. They don't make it a cabinet level position. Austin was not in a cabinet level position. So anyway, that's how these two men ended up um, representing the United States at uh, the United Nations. Um, before I go to the, the next slide, again, just some differences there. Austin tended to be a rather reserved personality. Uh, some of that came from his legal training, but also just his personality in general. And he didn't like to, if he could avoid it, getting into direct verbal confrontations with representatives, particularly from the Soviet Union. Uh, he was a rather late convert to the idea that the United States needed to engage the Soviets in the Cold War, and that the United Nations had to be a battleground for that as well. Austin really doesn't come along to this idea until about 1950, until the Korean War, whereas Lodge was on board immediately. And Lodge always, and you'll see in this clip, we'll hopefully get to watch a little bit, Lodge believed that every single Soviet attack on the United States had to receive an immediate American response, and that he was usually the one who wrote it. Um, he was a very happy and dedicated cold warrior. It's fair to say Austin was a more uh, reluctant one. Okay, so uh, so some of the other players, of course, Presidents Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, both men, broadly speaking, tended to believe that the United Nations had a lot of value, both as an institution itself and presenting and preventing conflicts but also as a means by which the United States could uh, pursue its foreign policy objectives. I think it's a little fair to say that Eisenhower was a bit more of a believer in it uh, than Harry Truman was. Both of them saw their UN ambassadors as also the primary salesmen to sell American membership in the United Nations to the American public. And this is another thing where Austin and Lodge tended to differ a lot. Lodge was a natural and happy salesman, Austin a little bit more reluctant with regards to that. Also, the relationships with both of these men um, and Austin and Lodge were very different. Uh, in terms of Truman and Austin, Austin, by his own admission, rarely personally met with Truman himself. Uh, you know, I looked in the, both Lod Austin's papers in Vermont and Truman's papers in Missouri, and there's not too much personal correspondence between the two. Um, generally, Austin tended to communicate more if the Secretary of State than he directly did if the president. And uh, again, as I mentioned, Austin did not have a cabinet-level position, and Austin in his own correspondence often felt frustrated that he and his staff at the United Nations were cut off in many ways from the State Department and from the White House and often not briefed on certain foreign policy ventures, the most notorious of which was the dispute over America recognizing the state of Israel. Of course, Truman and George Marshall, the Secretary of State, had a staunch division about that. Um, and Austin had assumed that Marshall was going to, Marshall's position was going to carry the day. And then when Truman instead oh, went over Marshall's head and said, no, America is recognizing Israel, the American delegation at the United Nations, which had been supporting Marshall's proposal of uh, one state, not two, an Arab state and a Jewish one, but just one state, uh, then they had to announce literally if less than 30 minutes to prepare this abrupt change in policy. Okay. And again, the two men were cordial, but as I mentioned, didn't have much of a personal relationship beyond that. Eisenhower and Lodge were close friends, and Eisenhower would frequently consult with Lodge on not just issues of foreign, but also domestic policy. Uh, one thing I found is that uh, because Lodge, although not a Catholic himself, he was Episcopalian, had extensive uh, dealings with the Catholic Church in Massachusetts, which was rapidly becoming one of the most Catholic states in America at the time. Uh, so Lodge advised Eisenhower on outreach to American Catholic voters. It's kind of ironic because Lodge's last position in American public life was as, as Richard Nixon's ambassador and Harry and Gerald Ford's ambassador to the Vatican. But also 
Lodge and Eisenhower consulted on how to deal with the problems faced by Joseph McCarthy uh, and what to do with his influence in the Republican Party and what to do with the phenomenon of McCarthyism in general. And Eisenhower's approach of dealing with McCarthy kind of from the background and particularly using McCarthy's attacks on the U.S. Army to undermine him, that was actually a strategy that Lodge had advised him on in many ways. Um, and also at one point, um, Eisenhower invited Lodge to basically do an audit of how the White House was being run, how the administration was being run. So again, a very different relationship with regards to that. All right. So um, Truman had uh, ultimately four secretaries of state, but the two ones I talk about extensively in the book are um, uh, that Austin dealt with were George Marshall and Dean Acheson. Of course, Marshall uh, had been uh, the chief of staff of the United States Armed Forces during the Second World War. It's not an exaggeration to say that he was Roosevelt's primary military advisor. Um, and then Truman brought him back to serve as Secretary of State uh, from 1947 until the end of his uh, first term in 1949. Now, Marshall and Austin, uh, probably because Marshall, much more so than the man I'm about to get to, was a much bigger believer in the viability of the United Nations to solve problems. And also because Marshall, kind of like Austin, came around a little bit later to actively confronting the Soviets on a lot of issues. The two men corresponded with each other frequently on foreign policy and what the United States sh should do with the United Nations, that type of thing. But Marshall, of course, because he never quite got over how he believed Truman had betrayed him over the question of Israel and American recognition of it, um, he told Truman that even if you get reelected, I'm not serving another term as your secretary of state. So when Truman won a surprise victory in the 1948 election over Thomas Dewey, uh, Marshall was replaced by Dean Acheson, who was, of course, a lawyer by background, also of some aristocratic heritage from both America, England, and Canada, and a very influential Secretary of State as well. Um, it's often said, and I don't disagree with this, that the late 40s to the early 60s were kind of a golden age for very strong, very influential secretaries of state, Marshall, Atchison, and then we get to him, John Foster Dulles. Okay, so Atchison and Austin did not have much of a relationship in terms of formatting American foreign policy. Out of all the men who I, you know, I examined in this book who were in positions of authority uh, in the United States during this time, either in the White House or the State Department, the one at the lowest opinion of the United Nations as an institution was Dean Acheson. He thought it served a role, a useful role in the Korean War, specifically, as we'll see, because the Soviets were boycotting the United Nations at the time and allowed the Truman administration to get the UN to authorize um, military action to um, remove the North Korean forces from South Korea under the flag of the United Nations. So Atchison said, because of those unique circumstances, the United Nations played a useful role. But generally, and I'm quoting him here, uh, I never believed the United Nations was worth a damn. And he later said in an interview in the 1960s that he found the UN General Secretary, who had taken over from Dag Hermarskold, a Burmesian diplomat named Utant, Atchison once referred to him as a contemptible little rat. So anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's move on to the Secretaries of State for um, Eisenhower. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, had it not been for this man on the left, John Foster Dulles, Lodge probably never would have been American ambassador to the United Nations. He probably would have been Secretary of State. Um, and But of course, because Dulles had had enormous amount of influence in foreign policy circles. He had actually helped advise the Versailles Peace Conference at the end of World War I and had been engaged through his law firm, Sullivan Cromwell, uh, Sullivan and Cromwell and various enterprises all over the world. He was the chairman of the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, he wrote a good part of the charter of the United Nations itself. Uh, there was no doubt that he was going to get the position of Secretary of State. 
Now, uh, of course, Dulles was, out of all the figures we're talking about, probably the most anti-communist in terms of confronting the Soviets, although, again, not wanting to risk a nuclear war over it, and the most on an ideological level as well, uh, which kind of merged with some of Dulles's religious beliefs. Now, Eisenhower said the hierarchy of U.S. foreign policy in terms of who's making it, I'm at the top, Dulles is second, Lodge is third. It didn't always work that way throughout the 1950s. Sometimes Lodge also complained about being bypassed on certain things. He, it took him be the better part of a decade to finally convince Dulles and Eisenhower to build a permanent American mission for the United Nations, its own headquarters. Before that, uh, Lodge, just like Austin, operated out of the famous Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. Also, one thing before I forget is that the United Nations headquarters, as it's known today, did not actually open until uh, 1953. Uh, so Warren Austin uh, and the United Nations uh, buildings he uh, went to was actually at a former ball bearing factory in Lake Success, New York. So again, the permanent headquarters, as we famously know it on Turtle Bay, uh, was not completed during that time period. That being said, although Dulles had a reputation as being a little difficult to work with and difficult to know, uh, Lodge had a much closer cooperative relationship with him than Austin did with uh, his superiors. Now, of course, Dulles um, passed away in 1959, uh, and so he was replaced by Christian Herder. Uh, also a New Englander, <laughs> um, Dulles was not, but Herder was, a former governor of Massachusetts, who basically took over as a placeholder secretary of state during the last 18 to 24 months of the Eisenhower administration. Um, and largely, the relationship between the two men uh, was like that of um, Dulles and, and um, Lodge as well, perhaps a little bit uh, closer, although um, Herder one time shot down one of Lodge's ideas of having a special session of the United Nations in the Soviet Union as, as a way of kind of staging a big propaganda victory over the Soviets. Now, um, in the book, and maybe I'll get into this in the Q&A, I organized the book along thematic lines that um, I look at, for example, um, the end of the European empires and how that played out at the United Nations, that this is the, the, the end of the British Empire, the French Empire, uh, the Dutch, the Spanish, the Italians, the Portuguese empires, the Belgian Empire, and the Congo is largely coming to an end during this time period, and how the American ambassadors had to play a very delicate game in not wanting to anger their European allies too much, but also not alienate, as Lodge said, all these emerging nations in Africa and Asia and drive them into the hands of the Soviets. And of course, and from my own background in, in, in uh, Soviet, in Russian history, the Soviet Union, of course, was administrated in many ways as an empire. Basically, Eastern Europe was the outer empire and the USSR itself was its inner empire. I've had some very interesting conversations with people in Central Asia and how the Russians treated them under communism. But of course, Publicly, the Soviet Union was committed to the goal of anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism. And so again, um, both Austin and Lodge, particularly Lodge, because this is when the empires really start to disintegrate by the mid to late 1950s, had to play a crucial role in keeping uh, and playing this balance of between the European powers and, of course, these new emerging nations. I also deal, of course, with the dueling of the Soviets on a variety of issues on the floor of the United Nations, uh, the Chinese question, which I'll come, which I'll come to in just a moment, because, uh, of course, in 1949, Mao's communists win the Chinese Civil War, but the United States, along with France, doesn't want to seat their representatives at the United Nations, doesn't want Mao's representatives on the UN Security Council, and so how Austin and Lodge had to deal with that. The question of atomic energy and what role the UN would have with that. And also the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom at the United Nations as well. That this was a close alliance in some ways, 
uh, a more acrimonious one um, in others. And also, again, I talk about how both men had to try and sell American membership in the United Nations, not just through television and radio appearances, but through publications to convince Americans that the UN was an organization that the United States should be a member of, should and should support, despite some of its limitations. Now, uh, for both ambassadors, I had to pick one event or, well, technically one time period that I thought this was really their crucible. This was the event which defined their tenure as UN ambassadors. And for Warren Austin, that was, of course, the Korean War. Now, of course, uh, Korea had been a colony of Japan, uh, de jure from 1905, de facto from 1910, until the end of the Second World War in 1945. Now, uh, the arrangement reached between Stalin and, Pot Stalin and Truman at the Potsdam Conference in the summer of 1945 was that the Korean Peninsula would be divided along the 38th parallel and that the, what was north of it would fall under Soviet auspices what was south of it would fall under American auspices. And then eventually there'd be elections supervised by the United Nations that would create a coalition government. Now, of course, as everyone knows, those elections never occurred um, for a unity government in Korea. You had, of course, fraudulent elections in North Korea to elect Kim Il-sung as the leader of North Korea of his government in Pyongyang. And then, of course, you had a little bit less, but still somewhat fraudulent elections in the south to elect Syngman Rhee, who formed a government in Seoul, south of the 38th parallel. Now, both, of course, Kim Il-sung and Syngman Rhee asked Stalin and Truman, respectively, to support a military effort to unite the peninsula under their leadership. The difference is, although Truman always told Rhee no, Stalin eventually, in early 1950, said yes. Uh, and Stalin and Mao Zedong, the leader of China, were convinced uh, by Kim that he could overrun and conquer the South, that America didn't really have a commitment to South Korea. Uh, they pointed to a speech made by Dean Acheson uh, in 1950, where he seemed to hint at that. Uh, and in the meantime, they could conquer it so quickly, the United States wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Now, at the same time, as I mentioned before, because the United States was refusing, and France too, was refusing to allow, to recognize Mao's government and allow Mao's representatives to replace Chiang Kai-shek's representatives on the UN Security Council, the Soviet Union was boycotting the United Nations during this time period. They didn't have any represent, they didn't have their representatives on the Security Council meetings. Now, why is this significant? Because when North Korea invades South Korea in June of 1950, not only is the Truman administration determined to repel the North Korean army from South Korea, but because the Soviets are boycotting the United Nations, um, they are able to pass a resolution from the UN Security Council justifying the removal of North Korean forces from South Korea. Because the Soviets weren't on the Security Council, they couldn't boycott that. So for Austin, this was the best of times, that the United Nations was acting to repel an aggressor and to keep the peace. And particularly after General Douglas MacArthur won his miraculous victory at Inchon, it looked like that uh, the North Korean army was going to be totally defeated and Korea would be unified under Syngman Rhee's government. And basically this was ever something everyone from Truman to Austin, to MacArthur, to the UN Secretary General Tryggve Lai from Norway were all supportive of. Of course, China intervenes in the Korean War in the fall of 1950, uh, pushes the UN coalition forces south of the 38th parallel, and leads to a very tense standoff uh, between the United Nations uh, coalition and China, North Korea, and possibly the Soviets on the other side. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, of course, with the famous conflict between Truman and MacArthur over how to effectively fight the war. Of course, uh, MacArthur wanted to take the war directly to China itself and also to sponsor an expedition of Chiang Kai-shek's army from Taiwan, where Chiang had fled to in 1949, and have them invade mainland China itself. And again, by airing these disagreements with Truman publicly, including writing letters to congressmen um, advocating a change in policy, Truman eventually had enough in the spring of 1951, removed MacArthur from his position as the commander of the UN coalition forces. And now there was the, a question whether legally 
Uh, in the view of the UN, he even had the right to do that or not. <laughs> but the reason I'm mentioning this is Austin was one of the primary members of the Republican Party who publicly supported Truman's, at the time, very, very controversial decision to remove MacArthur from, from power and justified it throughout the rest of his time as American ambassador uh, to the United Nations, uh, even in a time period where um, Truman's popularity dropped into the early 20s. Another thing Austin did that was significant during this time period was the Soviet government was refusing to recognize Trigvalai, the UN Secretary General from Norway, who was, again, a socialist, a social democrat, but anti-communist, and tried to get him removed from his position as Secretary General for supporting the UN actions to defend South Korea. And Austin basically stood his ground along with the British and French members of the Security Council and basically told the Soviets, who had now ended their boycott, that we're not allowing anyone to replace him at the UN Security Council. But it was an awkward situation where the Soviets refused to recognize him. And I think it's also fair to say that this event is what turned Austin, in many ways, into a committed anti-communist. Okay, and now for Lodge, it was in 1956 during the twin crises of the Hungarian Revolution, where the Hungarian people rose up against the communist regime that Stalin had imposed on them after World War II in late October and early November of 1956. And at the same time in North Africa, Israel, France, and Britain had launched a three-pronged approach to topple the Egyptian government of strongman Gamal Abdul Nasser and have him removed from power because he had seized control of the Suez Canal, which both Britain and France saw as their territory, their property. And Lodge uh, had to play a very delicate game. At this point, he is taking over administrating American foreign policy, largely because Dulles's health was starting to fail. He was in the hospital for an emergency appendectomy. It's also where the doctors found the pancreatic cancer that would eventually kill him. And of course, Eisenhower was also somewhat busy running for re-election once again against Adelaide Stevenson. Now, in the end, the United Nations wasn't able to do too much for the Hungarians once the Soviets invaded Hungary to reimpose communism, besides verbally protest it. But in terms of the Suez crisis, um, Lodge worked with Lester Pearson, uh, the Canadian uh, prime minister at the time, to introduce a proposal to create a United Nations emergency force, um, an armed force to serve as peacekeepers in Egypt and to prevent the war from expanding any further. And furthermore, Lodge, through Eisenhower, used his pressure to help get the British and the French to call off their assault um, on uh, the Egyptian government. But at the same time, and this is why I was talking about delicate balances here, to keep the Soviets from involving themselves in the conflict as well, which once Khrushchev had crunched the Hungarian rebellion was something he was very eager to do. So um, both men, after their time as UN ambassadors ended, uh, remained dedicated to supporting the organization and American efforts in it. And both of them, both in Lodge's memoirs and on Austin's tombstone, saw their time as representing America in the early Cold War at the United Nations as one of their most important contributions of decades of public service. But I think I'm pretty much reached my time limit here, so I thought I'd end the um, I thought I'd end the uh, PowerPoint, and hopefully we can watch an example of Lodge kind of in his element promoting American membership at the United Nations through his appearance on the 1950s uh, game show. What's my line? He's the surprise guest who comes on at the end, but he does talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, his role in the United uh, Nations. So hopefully we can uh, watch that uh, the last few minutes of it. I thought it'd be a good way of ending it. Are you in politics? It has a relation to politics. Mr. Allen? Certainly. Uh, <laughs> it, but it has a relation to politics. Are you in the Republican Party? I am. Is Francis? If it has a relation to politics, are you appointed rather than elected? I am. Mr. Sir. Have you anything to do with the Secretary of State in Foreign Affairs? I have something to do with Foreign Affairs. Ms. Gilgallan? Uh, 
Are you in his cabinet? I am. Uh, I think I know your voice, and I'm not going to pass. And I may be wrong, but I would say that you are Senator uh, Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> You and I come from the same hometown. Yes, sir. Is it right? Right. That's right. And that's yeah. where Henry Capitol. So tell them right. I didn't dare take it off. I was afraid of Fred. Believe me, I told you he yes, spotted I, my frog right away. Yes, I. I uh, just the second time around, I heard him. I recognize the board. I was just hoping that. Fred would confuse your Boston accent with my inherited Boston accent, but he didn't get confused. So <laughs> I like to know how the senator got his uh, uh, voice out of his nose. Mine is still up there. <laughs> the take years of training. Because actually, uh, all of the panel know, and I'm sure all of you folks at home know, that uh, Ambassador Lodge is our representative to the United Nations. And if I'm not intruding, sir, upon your work hours and not asking questions you don't want to answer, you probably have to deal with our Russian friends in the UN more than anybody else. Is there any formula for getting along with them, or how do you get along with them? Well, every time that a uh, communist speaks in the United Nations, I make it a point to speak myself. Uh, so that in the news story that goes out over the world, there's always something about the viewpoint of the United States of America. And this well, is the formula that works. That's well, that's my formula. Actually, I'm not meaning to pin any poses on you in this bright light of publicity. That um, one of the things that happened when you went to the UN was that the Russians, every time they did get up and spill their propaganda, were met immediately with the United States arguments, and I think it's done a great service to the country. Uh, this is all I had to say, really, about it. Well, that's very nice. Thank nice you to come and see us. I must tell you one thing, and we were hoping that you get into the entertainment side of it and get the ask. The ambassador, if he was on television, he was going to say yes quite a bit. And he is. He's on the <laughs> U.S. television all the time. Sandy, you know, it is tricky. Uh, we've been playing this game quite a while. And with our blindfolds on, we listen to the applause. And if there's a lot of applause after you've signed in, more than when you have signed in, that usually means that somebody in the audience doesn't readily recognize you. And that's how we went on. That helps a lot, Ms. Gilgallon? Doesn't help me a bit. I thought from the applause and the quality and the kind of applause, that it was a very curvaceous girl like Julie London. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeffrey. All right, that's good. As I told uh, Dr. Brennan yesterday, I, I was pretty amazed that uh, uh, he actually showed up on a game show like this. And today, it would be uh, almost impossible to think one of our uh, United Nations show up on a game show. Well, we'll be back in just okay, I gotta somehow kill well, the YouTube. Earlier, going on to other ones. Be away from us a couple of weeks. Going out to California. With... Okay. Um, Sean, I'll let folks join uh, questions here. Uh, as we we have one, yeah. but I would we got, we got one. one. Yeah, I'd like to to start uh, with a question I have that. Lodge act as the uh, escort for Khrushchev in 1960. Uh, any observations that he may have had in his memoirs or his papers about uh, that being being detailed as an escort officer? Oh yeah, that that was a really interesting assignment for him because uh, more or less, I mean, Khrushchev kind of just invited himself to the United States, uh, and. A few months before, of course, Richard Nixon had attended the World's Fair in Moscow, and they had gotten into the famous kitchen debate where Nixon was trying to say to Khrushchev, conceding to him, OK, your army is bigger than ours. You have more nuclear weapons than us, which wasn't true. But we 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 could provide a better lifestyle, right, uh, through our model American kitchen, right? And Khrushchev refused to concede anything. And it got so heated at one point that uh, the executive of PepsiCo stepped between them and offered Khrushchev a Pepsi to try and calm things down. But anyway, so um, Khrushchev decided after that, now I want to come to America and I want to see this, I want to see that. So um, Lodge was put in charge uh, of that. And so he toured of Khrushchev from New York to Washington to Camp David. He had to explain to Khrushchev that, no, no, 
being invited to Camp David is a major honor. You know, Khrushchev thought it was insulting because it was named after Eisenhower's grandson. And, and uh, um, Zalaj had to calm him down there. There was a, they actually got stuck in an elevator at one point in New York City, and he had to literally get under Khrushchev's butt and push him up through the gate. <laughs> um, Khrushchev got into a kind of a shouting match uh, with the mayor of Los Angeles, so Lodge had to kind of calm that down. Yeah, it was an interesting experience between the two men. Yeah, I saw um, that he was upset in Los Angeles because he couldn't go to Disney World. Right, he wasn't allowed to go Disneyland to Disney World. There, yeah. He wasn't allowed to go to Disney World for the, the for Disneyland for security risks. And also, I mean, Khrushchev got he met with some labor leaders in both New York and in San Francisco. That didn't go very well. Uh, they were protesters, and sometimes we drove around Hungarian Americans, Ukrainian Americans. Um, and that being said, the whole thing didn't quite fall apart. And actually, I gave a, a paper on this in Croatia a few years ago. Um, Lodge was actually invited to the Soviet Union, which he went to in, in uh, 19, early 1960. He went to Moscow, Leningrad, but also to Central Asia as well. And that was supposed to pave the way for Eisenhower to go to the Soviet Union later. And that wouldn't have been Eisenhower's first time. He went to the Soviet Union in 1945 at the end of World War II. That's where Eisenhower heard that uh, Japan had surrendered. He was attending a reception at the American embassy in, in Moscow. But anyway, again, you had the U-2 incident. Uh, Powers plane was shot down. Khrushchev wanted to really play a lot out of that. Uh, you know, he comes back to America, lodges it with him this time. That's when you have the shoe banging incident. And uh, so I, Ike's trip to Moscow never happens. Um, and it's seen by some historians, I don't really agree, but like, is this great missed opportunity to have ended the Cold War, to have resolved something about the Berlin question? Yeah. So, but yeah, that was, that was a big, uh, there's a whole book. There's been a couple of books written on Khrushchev's trip alone. Um, like he was nicknamed K in official documents, right? So Lodge wrote back to Eisenhower many times, K blows top. <laughs> that, that he had gotten pissed, Khrushchev had gotten pissed about something. I will say this about Khrushchev. Um, he was the same way as the Soviet leader. I mean, Leonid Brezhnev, who overthrew Khrushchev in October of 64, once said that, you know, when we met with Comrade Khrushchev at Presidium meetings, we didn't know if he'd talk to us for an hour or whether he'd scream at us for an hour. Uh, was this the trip where he also went to Eisenhower's farm up in Gettysburg? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the one when he comes back in 1960, there's no pleasantries. Like the New York longshoremen didn't even want to unload Khrushchev's boat, for example, when he came back in 1960. So after the U-2 incident. Uh, this question, uh person would like to remain unknown. Uh, but he wants to know what Lodge, he or she wants to know what Lodge's involvement with CIA covert actions were in the overthrow of the governments in Guatemala and Iran. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, there's little evidence that Lodge had any role in planning them. That was largely done through the CIA, which was, um, uh, and to a lesser extent, the State Department, which were being run by two brothers, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, who was head of the CIA, his younger brother. But Austin played a big role at the UN in selling both of them, both the, the coup against Guatemala and uh, the coup in Guatemala to overthrow Jakob or Benz's socialist government. Um, and in Iran, where basically the, the Shah of Iran and his prime minister, Mohammed Mossadegh, were in a power struggle. And uh, the CIA, of course, um, aligned up with, with the, the Shah. Now, the for the most part, I mean, with the case of Iran, the British also were involved in that coup and they were in total support of it. But Guatemala is actually a really fascinating case study because a lot of countries in the United Nations wanted to have this inv an investigation in the United Nations about American involvement in the coup in Guatemala in uh, 1953. And not just, you know, it was it's just the Soviets or another country that was, you know, had a difficult relationship with America during the time, India, they could ignore that. But actually the British government wanted to say, okay, yes, it, the Organization of American States, Lodge was saying, well, they're investigating it. They haven't found anything. No, that's not good enough. 
we um, we also support having a UN investigation of it because British Honduras or what's better known as Belize had a border had had a border dispute with Guatemala and our Benz's government resolved that right so Austin basically said and Eisenhower ordered him explicitly to do this you tell the British you want to you want to bring up Guatemala and the United Nations fine we bring up Cyprus at the United Nations because we know you don't want to talk about your base in site your bases in Cyprus and the problems going on there between the Greeks and the Turks and everything you you don't want that discussed in the UN will you you bring up Guatemala we'll bring up this and they told the French government which also was open to discussing the coup in Guatemala they told them you know you don't want to talk about Algeria um right now well we'll bring that we'll make sure that gets brought up at the UN too so then Paris and London dropped their claims on that pretty quick so very much you know kind of diplomatic horse trading going on here uh, this question comes from Jim. Can you discuss the relationship between Kennedy and Lodge? Yeah, um, the the two men had um, somewhat of a mutual respect for each other. Um, there is some correspondence between Lodge and Kennedy um, in the 1950s uh, during the senatorial time. And then, of course, also Kennedy famously appointed Lodge to be American ambassador to South Vietnam in 1963. And People have always believed, and Kennedy could be rather Machiavellian in this, uh, a lot of people saw Lodge as a possible GOP nominee for the presidency in 64. Uh, the reason why Lodge didn't, for example, finish his time as American ambassador to the UN in 1960 was because he left a few months before Eisenhower's term ended because he was Richard Nixon's running mate. And by all accounts, Lodge and, and Kennedy, when Lodge was in Saigon, in South Vietnam, they communicated on a fairly regular basis. Um, again, Lodge spoke French, which all the South Vietnamese government officials and mi military officers spoke. So he was a logical choice for that. Um, again, William Nichter, who wrote this book on Lodge, The Last Brahmin, he did some groundbreaking scholarship on Lodge's role in supporting the coup against No Jin Diem the uh, leader of South Vietnam in November of 1963, which was really Kennedy's last big foreign policy initiative. I mean, he was assassinated a few months after Diem was. And he came to the conclusion that in the end, Lodge had cold feet on that coup because it was clear that uh, the South Vietnamese military leaders wanted to kill Diem and his family members. And so he made some half-hearted attempts to call it off. And uh, Kennedy's like, nah, we're going with it. <laughs> DM's too troublesome. And um, and it's widely seen for all of Lodge's um public service and everything as kind of the black mark uh during his time. Uh he eventually was pulled out, but Lyndon Johnson sent him back in to South Vietnam again, and they also made him later ambassador to West Germany. Um, and then Lodge was basically for a while kissing his deputy at the Paris peace conferences between America and North Vietnam to try and end that conflict. So. Uh, that's it for questions. Anything in closing? Sean, anything in closing? No, I just, I, uh, I appreciate, um, again, everyone's coming. And um, I think one other thing that Lodge and Austin kind of worried about, uh, and even Lodge kind of came around to this, was the problem with having that the UN function best when dictatorial regimes couldn't veto what it could do. And I think we've kind of seen that issue with some international institutions that the hope was that um, they would make repressive regimes more liberal, and that really hasn't been the case at all. Uh, so I got to say that I don't think Austin or Lodge would be too surprised by that. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, for those in attendance, uh, our next lecture will be on July 12th. Uh, a Dove Amongst Eagles. It's a little bit a different story. It's a story of Linda Patterson, who adopted her brother's uh, unit in Vietnam uh, after he was killed. She went over there to find out what happened uh, without necessarily the support of the U.S. government. And then uh, she took, in a sense, made sure that unit was welcomed back to the United States and really became, in a sense, an adopted mother uh, of the soldiers of that particular battalion. Uh, and she'll be joined by uh, Colonel retired Frank Hancock, who was the battalion commander for that unit when they deployed to Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So she's going to talk about her experiences, and uh, Colonel Hancock's going to talk about what a great lady she is 
and all the good things he's done for soldiers. So July 12th at 7 p.m., please, please join us. Sean, again, thanks. Uh, look forward to getting back up the University of Scranton and uh, seeing what's going on up there. Can't wait to have you. Okay, have a great night. Bye. Thank you.